welcome to worship everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this week. And we hope that this time will be a blessing. Our prayer is that the Holy Spirit would um, encourage us and challenge us as we sing together and, and open God's word and, and reflect on the great news of the gospel with one another. Let's worship together.
UMCOR understands that this is a long-term event and we'll be there alongside of the conferences, the People United Methodist Church and our external partners through the recovery process. These are uh, the folks who uh, either as a volunteer or part of their conference personnel staff uh, coordinate and anticipate and plan for events such as this. Readying their resources and their volunteers uh, even in advance and even as it unfolds, staging their relief supplies, anticipating response needs, securing resources so that they can respond more, more quickly. It is those people of the conferences in the United Methodist Church who are of course feet on the ground. Pray for the people, for those who are first responders, those who are helping, and of course all, for all of those who are in harm's way. Uh, they do express that they feel those prayers and it means a lot to them to know that we are surrounding them and lifting them up in prayer. People who want to do something can easily make kits, relief kits. Uh, that information is on UMCOR's website. Another thing that people can do clearly is to donate to UMCOR. 100% of the donor dollar goes to helping people in need. I just want to say what a privilege it is to be a part of a connection of United Methodist people and also part of the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster. That network of voluntary sector folks and generous givers is so powerful and really does make a difference in the lives of people. We come now to this very special time when we go together to the Lord in prayer, uh, to, to praise God for, for who He is in our lives, to lift up our concerns, and to share our joys. So please join us as we go together in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we join together now. We turn our thoughts, we turn our emotions, to you at this point completely we acknowledge and with grateful hearts that you called us to your throne of grace and that you are always more willing to hear us pray than we are to actually pray but we come to you this morning believing that you hear our prayers that you assimilate our prayers and that you ultimately answer our prayers according to your perfect plan. And so, Lord, thank you for, for your concern for our individual lives, for every detail of our lives. And we praise you for giving us the ultimate display of your love in our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We can't thank you enough for that great moment that we can live with hope. And so many people today are hopeless. But we know that in the midst of strife and turmoil that we can live as people with hope. And we can have that security in our lives amidst the uncertainty that surrounds us. And so thank you, God, for the faith that you've given us, that we can cling to that for our own selves and that we can share it with others to promote your goodness and your grace to other people. We come, Lord, in a world today that is in such turmoil, we remember those in, in Haiti who are suffering so much. Thank you for the church and for other organizations that are going and meeting the needs of those people. For those in Tennessee, next door to us, who are struggling with the floods and the aftermath, the devastation. 
Lord, we lift up Afghanistan. And for those who are there who still want to come home, that you would help our leaders negotiate a safe release for them to come back and be with their families here in America. We think of those, Lord, with COVID as, 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 it's, as it's spreading again. For those who live in fear, for those who live in anxiety, help us to come to that conclusion, that conviction that you hold our lives. Not a disease, not a disaster, but you hold our lives. And help us to just each day that you give us breath to wake up and to offer ourselves to you and to give our lives to you in a fresh way each morning and before we go to bed each night. Lord, thank you for the blessing of living in a, in a nation like we do. We, we look around the world and we see so much hurt and so much pain. And we feel so blessed to live in such a promised land, a land of beauty, a land of freedom, a land of opportunity. Thank you, Lord God, for your church and for all of us listening to be part of your church. The privilege that that is of being part of a movement that has preceded us by 2,000 years and will be still reaching the world with the good news far after our lives have ended. And so Lord, help us while we're here to support your church to be grateful for the opportunities that we can be part of the work, your work in the world through your church. Lord, we ask you as we open the word today that, that you would speak through Monica and help her to, 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 to uh, lead us to understand the message on truth. For your word is truth. So Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit today as we continue our worship that we would hear and heed the word that you have for us. We lift up ourselves, our families, our community, our nation, and the world before the God of all grace and the God of all comfort. For you are our ultimate face in life. And we make our prayer, as always, in the wonderful spirit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, our scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 1 through 5, 14 through 18. Listen for the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is a red balloon. 
It's true, it's red, we all know our colors. The absolute truth is that this balloon is red. No, it's not. That's green. What? This right here is a green balloon. That is the prettiest yellow balloon. <laughs> yellow? Th this is red. Yeah, come over here. No, it's green. It's red! Yeah, I know, it's a red balloon. <laughs> hey, will you look at it from my point of view, please? What? Hey, nice blue balloon. Blue. It's green! Green? It's red. What? Why are you saying it's red when it's blue, huh? It's what? totally purple from here! Purple? Okay, you know what? Let's just settle this once and for all, okay? Well, where are you going? Hey, what color is this balloon? I only see in black and white. Okay. Hey, Mark, what color? There is no balloon. This is ridiculous. Hey, I know what the problem is. Look, um, my mom taught me that this was blue. But, um, you know, then she said this is red and green, yellow, you know, and on and on. <laughs> okay, I get that your mom taught you that that was blue, but I mean, that's not the truth. Whoa, why are you talking bad about his mom? Yeah. I'm not. Listen, I respect your mother. Thank you. And the way she raised you. She taught you that was blue. Our moms taught us that it was red. That's the way it goes. I thought you oh. said it was green. It is green. See, I'm smart. I went to college. <laughs> and in college, I learned all these different theories about color. Really? And my color professors who have doctorates in color do you have a doctorate in color? Uh, no. It shows. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> they can't even agree on one theory of color, so you have to look at all the different theories and pick which one works best for you. And green is great for me. That makes sense. Thank you. No, you can't just pick whatever color fits your life the best. Red is red. Okay, do you know the word intolerant? Yeah. Because that's what you're being right now. <laughs> all right, you're shoving your opinion down my throat. Okay, it's not my opinion, it's the truth. <laughs> hold on, hold on. All we're saying is that we need to stop arguing about trivial things like truth. You know, the funny thing about truth is, it's true, whether you believe it or not. In the video, I'm sure that you can relate. You've been in situations such as where people find differences and trying to come up with a commonality, but yet the truths are very far apart. I'm sure if I took a poll this morning online or in person that there would be the same types of differences. Ruth Hubbard in 1988 coined the phrase, truth is in the eye of the beholder. Just like in the video we just watched. So what is truth? What does that look like? How do we define that? Well, Webster's Dictionary defines truth as that which is true or in accordance with fact or reality. So I ask you this morning, do you find yourself in a place searching for truth? Today, we're going to be looking at scripture and unpacking what Jesus has to say to us about truth. But more than that, what does Jesus reveal about truth? And first, before we do that, we need to go back into Genesis to look at what does it mean in the beginning was the word. And what he's referencing to the gospel of John is that in the beginning, when God spoke order into creation, Jesus was there. That Jesus was not a part or a separate entity of God, but a part of a beautiful triune God, where it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so with that, when we were created, God wanted to be in relationship with us. And so many times throughout the Old Testament, he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And he reveals himself, just like he revealed himself to Moses up on the mountain. Moses couldn't see him because if he did, he would surely die because the power of God was so strong. But when he came off that mountain, there was a glow about him. And scripture said he was shining. And so as people looked on him, there was a difference. There was the presence of God on him. And so with that, that was evidence that, wow, God is true. There is truth in God's words because there was fact 
and there was reality. But more than that, in Genesis 28, God speaks and says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And again, in Deuteronomy, for the Lord your God is merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. And the prophet Isaiah claims that this beautiful God will be with us. And we didn't understand what that means, especially the Israelites. They didn't understand that God was going to come in human form, but he prophesied to that. And in Joshua Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Throughout Scripture from Genesis to the Gospels, God's words are threads of truth, even when they're not visible. And there's this beautiful story in 1 Kings 17, and it's Elijah. And God speaks to Elijah and tells him to go into the land and tell King Ahab that no rain was going to be coming. So he does. He he travels there and tells him that no rain will be coming. And at that time, the land was corrupt. There were people building idols and worship, and most of the people worshiped Baal. And so in that, Elijah went. And so as things became a little bit under turmoil, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and says, telling him to go ahead to the east of the Jordan. And on his journey, God sent ravens to bring bread and meat each morning and each evening. Now, I don't know if you caught that or not, ravens. Ravens were not typically used. They were, they were birds that were not used for God's purposes. We don't hear about that a lot. But God used it because to show Elijah that he was with him. And so in that journey, he came to him a second time, and he tells him to go to Zarephath, that a widow would care for him and give him food. And when Elijah reaches the widow's home, she's gathering sticks, and he says, can you get me something to drink and a little cake of bread? And she said, sir, I only have a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. My jars are dry. And he said, it's okay. Go ahead and make me a cake of bread out of that first and then some for your son and yourself. And he says, you will have plenty. And so the woman does as she's told and she offers him bread and she makes it for herself and her son and in that they ate. But they, day after day after day, as the jars were replenished and they never ran dry. So throughout the events later on, the woman realizes that the Lord had been upon them. She says, now I know the word of the Lord through your mouth is true. And so we see this beautiful truth of who God is even in the midst of hard spaces, that God is a God, an everlasting God, a God that is fast-forwarding and going with us, providing everything we need. And the Gospel of John brings this forward, and we see this so beautiful in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And so in this First statement, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Jesus was a part of that 
from the beginning until now. And God reveals himself. God reveals himself, opening up the eyes of people coming to be with us. And at Christmas, we use the beautiful words, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And this gives us a glimpse of truth because at that point we can see and we can touch and we can feel Jesus and we can see God at work. And you might be saying, well, well how do we do that? How, what was happening at that time? Jesus offered not only a living proof of the truth of God, but he in the incarnation of God in human flesh, he offered a voice of truth. And the truth that Jesus spoke about was more than just a moral guide for living. He offered truth that is a foundation for who we are and whose we are. And we see this throughout the, the book of John, not only just the first chapter, or John 3.16, we see this when Jesus shows up at the wedding. The wedding in Cana, and they run out of wine. And this is his first miracle. And his mom knows exactly who he is. And she asks him, they've run out of wine. Can you, can you change that? Can you, can you make them... Something. He goes, woman, it's not time for me to be revealed yet. But yet, he does it. He does it. And there's a beautiful story in that into which it's not just offering them a tangible gift. This gift he was revealing was the presence of God that transforms our lives through his power and his grace which we know is truth. And so then we read on, and he, he goes by the, the pool in Bethesda, and he speaks to a man who's lying there. And he said, why are you lying here? And this man had been lying there for a long time, and he could not move because he was paralyzed, and he knew that the Holy Spirit came down and would stir the water, and if you got you were the first one in the water, you might be healed. And Jesus says, get up, take your mat, you're well. He offers a glimpse of that restoration and the power of God in the flesh. But it's more than that. Throughout the Gospel of John, John sets up this whole chapter in that first verse when he says, he came in flesh. God came in the flesh to be with us. And in that flesh, he does so much. And every verse that we go through reveals the incarnation of Christ, this beautiful image of God in the flesh where healing and loving and presence is made known. But it even goes a little bit further than that Jesus says it in his own words. I tell you the truth. And he uses that phrase over 12 times. And in chapter 14, he says, I, tell, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it wasn't because Jesus was a separate advocate, but Jesus was God in the flesh and divine. There was no other way. And when he says, I am, it takes us back to when Moses questions who God is and says, you know, what's your name? And he says, I am. Meaning, I am it. Like, I, it's, it is I, the only one, the creator the God above all things. I am. And then Jesus goes on to talk about being the vine and the branches and how there was, we are a part of God and God is a part of us, but when we're severed from that, we're, we're distant. 
And then he shares even more the miracles of what was happening. And Jesus shows the presence of his love made known. It goes on and on and on throughout this story and out scripture, throughout scripture. John makes it very clear that it, Jesus was not just a person on the scene. He was just not a prophet or a teacher or a rabbi. It was God. That reality and the fact was true. And for us as followers of Christ or those that are searching for that truth, this is real truth. There's no question about it. There's no other one coming. This is truth. Because everything that God had promised in the Old Testament and how he lived and what he said became fact through Jesus' life and ministry. I want us to think about this just a minute. So what, what does this mean for us? Well, in this passage we read in 1 John, it's not just for information. Jesus didn't just come to give us information and say, well, I'm the truth of God. He wanted to give us the truth so that we would live the truth. You see, the only reason God came in the flesh is because the world became very corrupt. And people lost their way. He loved us so much that he came to be with us so that we would no longer be lost, but we would know the true path and he would guide us in that. Scripture tells us that the word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path that offers us information that offers us that spiritual word for us to live by so that we don't have to wonder about the truth. We have the truth, which is God, made known through Christ. And so living this out is something Christ taught us taught the disciples, teaches us in the word. So if we, the best example for us to think about this is to look at the example of the disciples walking with Jesus. First, let's look at who did Jesus call? Jesus called ordinary fishermen, ordinary people that had trades outside of being a Pharisee or someone that was a teacher or a rabbi, somebody that didn't really even know. And in that, those disciples, with their unique gifts and their own personalities, followed Jesus. And Jesus shared this truth with them every step of the way, whether it was on a boat, by a seashore, in the healing of a person, sitting with a woman at the well while they went and ate, or stopping to heal a hemorrhaging woman, or feeding the 5,000 on a mountainside. Jesus showed them the truth was about being present and in relationship with people. I will always be with you. So living that out was about being in the presence of God and carrying that truth with us. That God is with us and we offer that gift to other people. And so as we continue to look at disciples, we, we see that they, they argued, who's the best among us? And Jesus said, no one. And it begins to explain that it's not a pecking order, it's not a hierarchy, but it is about being present. It's about being who you are. It's about being a follower of Jesus Christ, living in that truth, not our own truth. Now, I will tell you that we do share our own truths. 
As we read scripture, this is a living word. And so as I read scripture each day or each time I pick it up, God is telling me something new and different. And that experience is a truth in my life. And so to someone else, that truth may be their truth, but I may not understand it. But that doesn't mean it's false. And so as we look at truths, those disciples had different truths. Here, Judas thought he had a truth that it was about the money. And then you had Simon Peter that had a different truth. And you had Matthew, the tax collector. And you had Simon the zealot. You had all of them had those truths. And they were present with Jesus the entire time. But the one real truth that remained was Jesus was Lord. And Jesus loved us and came to be with us and was present, not just with the disciples and not just with the Jews, but everyone. That is the real truth. And so what do we do with that? I think it's, it's important for us to understand that when living the truth, it's about being in the image of Christ. Carrying that truth with us that God came in the form of a son called Jesus Christ to walk with us to offer us love and grace and truth through his redemptive power. Because if we don't carry that truth, then there is no real truth. So I challenge you today to think about a question that Pastor Chuck posed to us last week. He asked the question, what do we absorb in our life that helps us build our life on a solid foundation? But I want to reframe that, that question for us. What do we absorb in our life that helps us build our life on a solid foundation of truth? Is it news outlets? Is it social media? Is it family and friends? Internet searches? Gossip? Stereotypes. We can get caught up in a world where there's so many truths coming to us. It's so easy to Google. It's so easy to say, hey, Alexa or Google, what, is, what does this mean? What are the facts on this? Give me the statistics. Tell me the truth. And we'll get information but it may not be information that we need. And it's certainly not going to be what God's real truth may want us to be. So I challenge you, as we go forward, there are so many people out in the world searching for truth. And maybe it's you today that you've wondered, well, is this God really real? And what does it mean? I don't see God present, so is God really present with us? This is our truth. I challenge you to go to John's text, to read that, to delve into what God has for us through his son, Jesus Christ, and what Christ continues to offer us in his word, in those red letter words where he speaks to us. And in that challenge, besides reading scripture and knowing that truth, taking that truth in the world, not in our words, but in our actions. Francis of Assisi said, preach always, at all times, and when in doubt, use words. May the real truth go with you today, transform you and renew you that you do not walk alone.
Amen.